when you talk about the outcome as very specifically customer or user behavior, it's the teams that are closest to the customer who can actually tell you what the outcomes are that will be valuable. The people at the top of the organization, they can be the smartest people in the world who are the best people in the world at their job. They won't know that. And it's not because they're incapable of knowing it. It's because by virtue of their position in the company, they're worrying about other things. And so they're not as close to the day-to-day -day material like behaviors of the end users that the company needs to service. And so you need to have the people at the top of the organization saying, look, I see clearly from this level where we need to go. I see clearly that these are the problems we need to solve. But I don't have the line of sight to the details of what the end users are doing with our product. And I need the people with the line of sight to provide that insight to solving the problem. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast, where host Barry O'Reilly seeks to synthesize the superpowers of extraordinary individuals to think big, start small, and learn fast. Here's your host, Barry O'Reilly. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast. On this show, I'm delighted to be joined by Josh Scheiden, designer, strategy consultant, and coach, who's worked with some of the world's leading brands from PayPal to Johnson & Johnson to 3M and more. He helps clients launch and build new products and services, as well as help creating a more agile and entrepreneurial organization. With Jeff Gothelt, he's co-authored two fantastic books, Sense and Respond and Lean UX, where we first met each other as part of the Lean series. He's also wrote the phenomenal book, Outcomes Over Output, which focuses on helping teams understand customer behavior and how it drives to business outcomes. On this show, we go deep on his own experience, how he found his way into design, his first engagement with early computing, working to figure out aspects of goal setting in a design context, as well as then starting to apply it to larger organization in the terms of outcomes that teams can use to align at scale. I know Josh a long time. I've had a chance to work with him on some tough and really rewarding client engagements. And this show will give you unique insight to his story and what he's learned along the way in his own career. So let's get started. I remember my dad saying to me when I was 10 or 11 or 12, something like that, computers are the future. You know, this would have been in the, in the 70s, which I'll tell you how old I am. And, and one year, he bought us a computer. It was a Commodore PET. It had a tape drive. You know, every few years, he would upgrade that computer. We had an Apple II. Then I had a series of PCs. And, and along the way, I always, you know, I played with them and I, I learned a lot about them. And my like sort of early jobs out of school were, I sold computers for a while. And then I got a tech support job, moved to the Bay Area. I'm from New York. I got a tech support job and I sort of started in that company and, and worked my way up. And eventually I sort of inherited, the company understood it as a support problem, but I came to understand it as a design problem. It was a user interface design problem. And I got put in charge of that project to redesign the user interface of our little piece of, it was a very small piece of software. And I fell in love with that. I bought a bunch of books and I went to night school and I learned about it. One of the books I bought was from a guy named Alan Cooper, who wrote, I think, one of the most important like early user interface design books called About Face. And at the time, a friend of mine went to go work for him. And she called me up. She knew the work that I'd been doing. And she said, we're hiring designers here. I laughed. I was like, why are you telling me this? <laughs> I'm not a designer. And she said, no, that thing that you're doing here, we call that design. And so... Alan was really interesting at the time. This was 1990, it was mid-90s. It was kind of pre-commercial internet. And his thesis was that anybody who went to design school was unqualified to design software because everything that they had learned was about designing for the static world, it was designing for print or designing for industrial objects. And that the problem of dynamic state change in software, you press a button and suddenly the software is different, that people didn't understand how to do that. And he believed that he had to reinvent the field. And so he was only hiring people like me who were interested in it, but had no training. 
And so I went to work for him and that's where I got my training. I spent four years working in his design studio, learning how to be a designer. I absolutely love these stories. And also like some of the philosophy even behind, I suppose, like the insights and how to understand, like, sure, we might need some people who have a natural calling to this, but haven't been classically trained in the traditional practices. How fascinating for someone to have that philosophy even then. Because it's very hard. Like, that's the kind of stuff I always love when I do this show and talk to people about unlearning, right? The conventional wisdom is, what's the best design school in the country? Let's go pick the top, you know, 1% of naval aviators and stick them in uh, this program called Top Design Gun or whatever it's called. (laughs) And they'll be fine. And yet this is sort of, you know, especially, you know, you continue to work in these emerging fields and technologies and products to date, right? Where... Thinking about like the conventional wisdom is often flipped on its head. Is you find people who have a practicality to understanding about problems that need to be solved. You know, tech support's another great example. My first ever job was with a company called Gateway Computers. For other folks out on the internet, there the great wars of computer desktops was well, Apple were one, but. This in the time of Microsoft super hype, it was Gateway versus Dell. And of course, I chose Gateway, where I got my first job in. Who, <laughs> you know, I was back in Dublin like last week and drove by a huge call center, still exists with the Gateway sign sort of still on it. Like, and nobody has been in that building for over probably 20 years, which is crazy. But it gave me a great start in computing as well. So tell us a little bit more. Then as he started to practice this, right, you obviously got to be involved with a very emergent field. People are probably experiencing similar things like that around technologies like artificial intelligence and the like at the moment. So what were some of the things you learned about like figuring out possibilities, how to leverage these technologies? Like what were some of the things that you learned in that studio that maybe have helped you in multiple years later or multiple maybe technology cycles that you're seeing? So Alan's background was that he had been a software developer. He wrote software for microcomputers. One of his, I think his foundational insight was that when you're thinking like a programmer, you're thinking in terms of the structures that you're building. He called that the implementation model. How am I going to build this thing? What are the bricks? What are the, the data structures? What are the functions? And how do I make that easy and efficient and well-constructed? which is like really important stuff. But there's this other way of thinking about the system, which is the user's mental model. And so if you're trying to understand the user's mental model and design a system around what the end user is trying to do, I'm trying to make a meeting. I don't care that all of this stuff is stored in a database. If I'm a developer, I want to build the efficient database. But if I'm a user, I want to see a calendar. I don't want to see a database table. That sounds obvious now, but... but <laughs> You know, we've established a grammar for software now where calendars look like calendars, you know? So he had this kind of foundational understanding that there's the implementation model and the mental model. And to understand the mental model, you have to understand what he called the user's goals. And he had a whole system that he built around this. He called goal-directed design, which was, who are the humans? What are they trying to do? What are their goals? That was sort of my first introduction to that thinking and the importance of kind of starting with that question. Because when you start with that question, all of the new technologies just become like another ingredient for solving the same problem, which is who's the human, what is the human trying to do? And it doesn't matter like the transition from desktop software to the internet, the transition from internet 1.0 to internet 2.0, the transition to mobile computing, the transition to you know, AI and machine learning and all of this stuff, you're just bringing new capabilities to bear, but your North Star stays the same. I remember early on working for Alan and I was early project. It was with some very complex technology and I was really like in the weeds. I was like, I was having a hard time understanding this and these people, the client was arguing for X and this other person was arguing for Y and this other person at the client was arguing for Z. And I was like, Alan, you know, what do you do in these situations? Like, you've got all these people advocating for all this stuff. There's all this complexity. How do you navigate? He said, find bedrock. I said, what do you mean? He said, find the basic truth of the project that everyone agrees on 
and build up from there. Start building consensus from the fundamental truth that you can use as bedrock, which, you know, I think is, has served me many, many times, right? But for me, the, like the bedrock in all of this stuff, as the technology gets complex, the bedrock is who's the person and what is that person trying to do? Yeah, it's so fascinating to hear you talk like this. I've never heard you share that story either as well, which is always kind of even more fun when I do these shows. It's just like you get all these amazing nuggets of insight. Because what, when I think about you and even what you're doing today, right, where you've helped people with design, you've helped people with sense and respond ideas of testing and learning, you know, you wrote these great books around outcomes over outputs. And this notion, even of the definition of an outcome or a change in customer behavior, it leads to business impact. I can see actually how these things start to link together, just as you're describing these things, right? But starting from a design premise of what's the goal that this person is trying to achieve, and then a measurement technique to say, well, this is the behavior we want to see. And is that behavior happening? Or are we moving towards a direction that that, you know, it's a goal that has a behavior that leads to a business impact, which is really fascinating to hear you sort of share that other story. So if we jump sort of a little bit forward then to other folks and when they're thinking about the world they see you in today of helping teams get good at goal setting, defining success measures, thinking about outcomes that they're trying to drive and the products that they're building. Tell us a little bit about your own journey then to sort of get to that aha moment. Like, what did you have to unlearn? Because when I think about you describing this pattern of finding a bedrock where everyone agrees on the goal we're trying to achieve, and then people sort of get confused in the technology or the nits and bits of what's actually going on. Like, I see the same problem where people forget, like, why we're building something, they tend to measure like, have we built the feature fast enough? How long did it take us to build a feature? Is the technology integrated with the right solution rather than are we driving the customer behavior that we want and everything else is sort of like in service of that. So can you talk a little bit more about your own journey to helping people start to see those things? I I think one of the things that's been interesting for me as I've sort of moved along, you know, through these various stops in my career. When I first met Alan and first met goal-directed design, I was like, this is it. This is the answer. We have figured it out. Goals, you know? And it was like, that's awesome. And it really worked for me for a while, you know? And then what I realized was like, it was imperfect. It wasn't precise enough. It didn't work for everybody I was talking to. It didn't have all of the measurability that you need through the life of the system. How could we get more precise in that, right? There were a lot of other problems I was working on during that time, but let's just stay with this one, you know? Fast forward 10 years, and I was lucky to find the work of Eric Ries. That's where you and I met in the sort of lean startup community. And Eric had a lot of really useful ideas. And I think One of the useful ideas for him was this idea that the thing that you were making was not the important piece, but the important piece was the result and is the thing you're making creating an outcome. And I was like, yeah, I love that, you know? And so we wrote the first edition. We actually met because after Eric wrote The Lean Startup, he worked with O'Reilly to create a series of books about how you implement these ideas. And Jeff Gothelf and I wrote Lean UX, and you and your colleagues wrote Lean Enterprise. And it was about the sort of practical application of these ideas. And so we wrote Lean UX, the first edition, and we used this word outcomes. But I was I had this sort of feeling like I I was uneasy about that word because I wasn't sure I understood it. And I worked in the second edition to try and understand it more. And it really wasn't until the third edition that I'd done enough work with clients trying to implement the I remember the meeting where I finally got it in between the second edition and the third edition. I can, I can tell you about that meeting if you're interested. And so it really wasn't until the third edition that I felt like, okay, I understand this. And that sort of led to the decision to sort of expand the explanation in the standalone book of Outcomes Over Output, in which we say like, okay, we went from this sort of okay, what's a goal? People have goals. Sure, you want to honor them. 
or it's not important what you build, it's important what the outcome is. Well, what's an outcome? Is it just a result? Is it a goal? Is it the same thing? It's kind of a sloppy, we can use the word a lot of ways. And so coming to this understanding that an outcome is a valuable change in human behavior, a measurable change in human behavior that creates value. That's like super precise, super succinct, and really concrete for teams to use, you know? Actually, since that book was published, I had another breakthrough that even using that very precise definition, I was having trouble in workshops getting people to, okay, it's a measurable change in human behavior. Write the change on a post-it note. People were having tons of trouble articulating that. And what started to happen in workshops was I started to say, okay, you're going to give me three post-it notes instead of one. First post-it note's going to say who, that's the human. Second post-it note's going to say does what, that's the behavior, who does what. The third one, by how much, that's the measurable piece. Who does what, by how much. Through those three questions, cracked it open and made it super clear, super practical. That led us to the, the name of this next book that we're writing, which we're actually calling Who Does What by How Much. This is pretty, yeah. Well, it, like even just listening to you share that little narrative there, you know, it's a series of sort of unlearning well went together, which I always love, right? Like that's part of this stuff. And I think sometimes people often believe that the aha moment was always there. And yet it's so, it's so refreshing again for you to share an example of actually, no, I iterated towards this through a series of testing things and seeing what worked and what landed and what didn't. So just to sort of highlight that to people, do tell us this story about when you had this sort of aha moment, if you will, where you were like, ah, this is the Eureka here. So I had a client that was doing some annual planning and it was a team that was responsible for running a service at a nonprofit organization in New York. So this team, they were responsible and, and leadership had said to them, look, for next year, your target is to increase the net promoter score of your service. That's what we want you to do. And so for listeners who don't know, net promoter score is kind of a way, maybe it's a flawed way, but it's a way of measuring customer satisfaction and how likely people are to recommend your service. And so they, they called and they said, like, look, could you spend a few hours with us? Because we understand what the mission is, but we don't know how to get there. And could you come and could we talk through it? And so we just sort of started working on this problem. And we said, well, okay, like you have to explain the service to me. Because I, I didn't understand what the service was. So what are people doing? What are people doing today? And so we built this map on the wall. And we said, okay, we're trying to make people more satisfied. What are the things that people are doing that's causing dissatisfaction? And what are the things that we're doing on this map that are causing satisfaction? When things go well, it's because we did these things or we did them well. When things go badly, it's because we did these things or we did them badly. And so then we sort of had this annotated map. And it was like, in that moment, it was like, well, we're trying to increase net promoter score. What do people do that leads to an increase in net promoter score? What do people do that leads to a decrease in net promoter score? And in that moment, that link to behavior sort of really appeared to me. It's like, oh, this is what we really have to focus on. The, the outcome here is that the link to behavior. Yeah, no, it's just even super to hear you share that example. I think it's such a rich example because anyone listening to the show for the first time, whether they've ever heard about outcomes that are someone who have been interested in for a while, that's just such a very obvious, well-framed example where they could go and run that exercise even themselves right now. I guarantee you like half the people listening to the show are writing that exercise down and hopefully <laughs> running it down. But it, it is funny, you know, when you share these things, Josh, like I think you actually have one of these very interesting gifts of being able to communicate like complex things very easily and put them into practical terms very quickly. I need to share this story while we're on the podcast. Many people often ask me with Unlearn, like, how did you sort of get to this as a, a name, a term, a philosophy? And what I remember is that you and I were sitting in a restaurant in San Francisco. It was a Szechuan restaurant for anyone who's interested because it was pretty good and spicy food. And I was trying to explain this idea of like, you know, unlearning and people like struggle not learning new things and unlearning things and then they have to relearn and then get breakthroughs and you know and it was sort of spinning and I think 
I almost remind me of like, it's the Apple Martini moment that Justin Timberlake kindly offered in the Zuckerberg film where he's like, don't call it the Facebook, just call it Facebook. And you turned to me and said, just call it unlearn. That's all it needs to be. And people will get it. And it was one of these sort of, again, this sort of uh, eureka moments for me where it helped me crystallize what I was trying to explain. And you were kind enough to give me that insight by just bearing all that hot chili and then actually listening to me and helping me get that sort of framing. So I'm, I'm forever grateful for you for that. And these are sort of things as we continue to do, you know, in this industry, right? Like you're very open about sharing your own sort of, as you say, transitions in thinking or insights as you go through these iterations, which again is a classic sort of design trait innate to you. So talk a little bit about what you see that at an industry level, right? So folks are very interested in this idea of outcomes. Obviously, when you wrote Outcomes versus Outputs, I think it's a book that I constantly recommend to people. Uh, it's 40 minutes to read it. It's, again, very practical to help people get started. It encourages you to go on with Jeff to co-author this next book, specifically around helping people do that in large-scale enterprises. So what are some of the insights that you've had to see about First of all, yourself, when you got together with that group, you could put customer satisfaction up there and think about the behaviors. And that's a small group of people that can suddenly have an aha moment. But in organizations, you're trying to shift the mindset of hundreds of people, most likely, to sort of get behind a different way of thinking about measuring success and defining it beyond classic things like you know revenue and customer acquisition and a lot of sort of known measures. But this idea of coming up with unique measures to the product you're trying to build or ultimately the goal that the user has. So share a little bit about how you've worked your way through that for folks to listen into. You and I really, our conversation began around that question. When Jeff and I wrote Lean UX, it was because we were interested in figuring out how the traditional design process, which was designed around print artifacts and manufacturing artifacts, we were designing things that got manufactured or printed. So we, they had to be all ready, and then we'd hand them off. It's a classic waterfall method, and it works well for that kind of stuff, you know? And then we, Jeff and I both found ourselves in the software world, which is where our paths, Barry, intersected. And we became interested in sort of agile methods to create software. And design really didn't have a place in agile in the early days, you know, of the 19 men who ascended to the mountain, right? Uh, in Utah, none of them were, were designers, right? Oh, engineers and, only. <laughs> and so, you know, figuring out that process has been interesting to me for a long time. What we came to understand sort of in those early days was how to make it work at the team level. And it really works at the team level very easily when you've got, you know, 10, 12, 20 people, whatever it is, you can form a team or a handful of teams and you can really make a lot of progress using agile methods and cross-functional collaboration. It's hard to do, but it's very, very doable. Then the question started to be, well, how do we do it at scale? How do we do it in the enterprise, right? One of the things that I think has been interesting that has emerged over the last few years is this understanding that OKRs, which for listeners who may not have heard of them, stands for Objectives and Key Results, it is a kind of framework, a goal-setting framework that offers the potential for large organizations to apply some of these agile ideas to align large organizations and get them to work in agile ways, right? And so the connection between OKRs and OKRs the O is an objective, right? Which is what's the big audacious goal. And then the KR is the result. How do you measure it? The key result. And for most people who look at the system, they understand that to really do good key results, you want those key results to be outcomes. That's the intersection of the work that OKRs then starts to offer kind of a structured system for managing outcomes at scale. There's so much promise in that way of thinking about work and organizing work that, you know, Jeff and I together have really sort of leaned into it over the last few years. And 
what we've learned and what our point of view about it is what we're working to capture now in this book that's coming out this year. Exciting, right? And I'm looking forward to it because already I know there's going to be a bunch of, you know, very practical ways to try and help frame these things, but a bunch of fun stories. So tell us one of the fun stories that you, our traumas, whichever you prefer, you know, like trying to keep this at scale as well is a fascinating thing, right? And I know both of you are working with some of the world's largest companies to try and deploy this, right? So the names can be changed to protect the innocent, absolutely fine. But what are some of the anecdotes or maybe the gotchas, right? Because that's what most folks are going to fall into the trap. Again, it's exciting, the promise of this to align large groups of people around a common mission, but it's obviously very hard for the penny to drop for everyone to go, oh, I get it. I get why I need to figure out, a, as you said, for who, what they do and by how much, right? It is a great way of giving people a method, right? To actually get the ideas out of their head. So what, what have been some of the gotchas that you've come up against with as you're trying to teach people how to do this across, you know, some of the world's biggest companies? The first thing is, and I think this is true for any method or system, is that it's possible to take exactly what you've always done, give it a new name, and just keep doing the same old thing, right? So, so yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're doing our, Agile now. Product manager. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, we're doing- we're, 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 here's our plan for the next three months, <laughs> right? So I think that's something that I see all the time in large organizations. It's just there's there's a huge amount of organizational inertia in any large organization. Organizations got to be the way they are for a reason. And applying new methods without understanding the reasons that you got to where you are is unlikely to have kind of a global impact, you know? So that's the first thing. The second thing is like all of those success stories that you hear, right? So obviously I think there are a couple of big books about OKRs that most people who are interested in them read. John Doerr, the superstar venture capitalist, wrote a good book called Measure What Matters that I think really put them on the map for a lot of people. And, and the poster child that he describes is Google, that Google uses OKRs, which is true. And they've had great success, which is true. Everyone must use them. Google have coffee breaks at 1147. Let's <laughs> go here, coffee break them. Right. But the fact of the matter is, even Google doesn't use them universally well. So if you talk to folks at Google, they'll tell you a story that describes every company, which is, yeah, there's pockets where it's done really well, and it's a great tool. And over here, we've had great success with it. And yeah, right next door, yeah, they're not doing it so well. And so like, I think it's easy to sort of have this kind of grass is always greener feeling. To get specific, the biggest problem I think that I see with OKRs is that people take their task list and they say, well, here's our objective. And then our key results are we finish this task and this task and this task and this task. When we finish these 10 tasks, we've achieved our objective. But you know, we know that that's not true. That's the lesson of lean startup, that you can build it, you can build it right, and it cannot create no value. Yeah, exactly. I've built it right so many times. If just if just the customer used it the way I thought they were going to use it. Going back to that first story that I told you about, the first user interface redesign I did, the software development team that I was working with at the time didn't believe we had a problem. And so I did some classic usability tests. I brought users in and I videotaped them using our product. And I sent the videos to our team. Back then I had VHS cassettes that I FedExed to them. They watched the tapes. They called me the next day and they said, you know, Josh, we watched the first tape and we thought, where did Josh find such a stupid user? (laughs) And then we watched the second tape and we're like, man, Josh really found a lot of stupid users. And by the third tape, we started to think maybe we had a problem. Yeah, we watched all the tapes and we're all in. Where do we start? (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, so you can build this beautiful system that creates no value or that creates problems that you didn't anticipate. So the trick of OKRs is they don't tell you what to do. They ask the right question and they say, look, here's the thing we're trying to do. Here's how we're going to measure success. Now, team, figure out how to get there. And if you do it right, it unlocks the creativity of the team. 
if you can define the system of outcomes across multiple teams, you get alignment, you get autonomy, and you get accountability because everybody's set declared in advance, these are the results that we're signing up for. And then every week, every month, every quarter, you're checking in against those results. That's part of OKRs is not just writing your goals, but it's that rhythm. The thing that makes it agile is there's a, a rhythm of checking in each week, each month, each quarter, checking in on progress and adjusting course until you know you get to your result. They're all great lessons you shared there, but the one that certainly jumps out to me as a huge breakthrough when you get it right is the creativity aspect. One of the things I certainly like to do when I meet companies is get them to share how they're measuring success. And instantly you get this sense. And even when you talk to the teams, when there might be an objective, like, you know, we're going to change the world. And then there's just a list of all these tasks they're going to do. That's often handed to teams as well, right? By a manager or a career. And you see instantly teams go to this sort of, we're almost on the debt march straight away. We're going to be measured on executing this task list. And that's the job, right? It's just, how do I break this down and deliver it as cheaply, fastly, as quickly as possible? And all I'm focused on is putting my head down and just doing the work. And it, it can feel like a death march. But when you get to this place, where you're almost putting a challenge to the team or an invitation to sort of say, you know, we want to increase whatever it might be, customer conversion or retention by 20% over the next six months. What do you think? You know, suddenly you, you engage like a hundred brains in the company rather than one person just trying to sort of figure it out on their own and create a task list for everyone else to execute. And, you know, I've certainly seen when you, create that opportunity by defining, here's where I want to get to, help me figure out how to get there. Like that's a whole different type of culture. It's a, a different ask of the team. It's really an ask for help, right? And a recognition that you don't know all the answers and we'll figure it out together. And that for me is part of the magic of all this is that you then start engaging these, whatever, the hundred brains in the room. So everyone's suddenly thinking on how to solve this problem versus the sort of dependency or the fragility in a way of one person. They might be the senior person, but one person trying to figure out this problem on their own and their expression of how they think the problem could be solved and that having nine people execute that. You're sort of undefeatable in the first model when you've a hundred brains working on something rather than one. And, you know, I think for me, that's the big promise here. Yeah. And I think that that it's there's this interesting thing that starts to happen when, you know, in my experience of, of trying to align an organization around an outcome, when you talk about the outcome as very specifically customer or user behavior, it's the teams that are closest to the customer who can actually tell you what the outcomes are that will be valuable. The people at the top of the organization they can be the smartest people in the world who are the best people in the world at their job. They won't know that. And it's not because they're incapable of knowing it. It's because by virtue of their position in the company, they're worrying about other things. And so they're not as close to the day-to-day -day material like behaviors of the end users that the company needs to service. And so you need to have the people at the top of the organization saying, look, I see clearly from this level where we need to go. I see clearly that these are the problems we need to solve, but I don't have the line of sight to the details of what the end users are doing with our product. And I need the people with the line of sight to provide that insight to solving the problem. So the difference in where you sit in the organization means that you know different things about the market. And if you can't leverage those different points of view, you're not going to win. And it's not that like some people are smart and some people are not. It's that everybody is seeing different things by dint of their position in the organization. And you need a way to have that conversation across the layers. Yeah, well, it sort of gives me a perfect bridge to, I guess, where we both started our computing career on and in sitting in customer support and these massive <laughs> organizations where, you know, I always felt the folks on the phone, they knew the customer problems because guess who was ringing them up to sort of share 
what wasn't working, what was broken, you know, and it was hard for an exec or a leadership person because they never got that like continuous stream of feedback information from customers saying why it didn't work, just like your story of recording videos of users using the product and getting that information to the engineering team so they could sort of have these aha moments, right? I think when you, as you say, create this information flow or insights from people who are closest to the customer problems, behaviors, experiences, it can be a pretty amazing thing about how everybody can solve problems together. Joseph, it's been super fun to have you on this and you know go through your colored career twists and turns. What are you most excited about then looking forward? You know, the book's going to be out. Highly recommend everybody go out and grab a copy. Your link will be in the show notes. So what are you most excited about now as you look forward in this space? I'm really looking forward to the book coming out. Every time Jeff and I write a book, we say we'll never write another book. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this one being done. But I'm excited about this. I'm excited about this. Who does what by how much? It'll be out sort of early summer. And I think, you know, for me, I really love the conversations that happen after the book comes out because people really start to put these ideas to work and we start to see some of the impact of the book. Honestly, the things we got right, honestly, the challenges we need to work on for the second edition, you know, that part is really fun for me. And it's the part that keeps me going. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting this book out in the world and then talking to readers about it. Right on. Well, look, I know it's going to be great. I know it's going to be a great calling card as well. And lightning rod for the community is all the work you guys have put out, which has been super and stellar. Again, thanks for being on the show. I'm sure we'll have you back again when we get to iteration four of whatever the next thing is going to be. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and sharing. Barry, always great to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that show but I'm even more delighted to share the exciting news. I've recently co-founded a new venture studio named Nobody Studios. Now, Venture Studio is a vehicle for the rapid creation of new companies from ideation to acceleration and growth. And our purpose at Nobody Studios will be to de-risk pre-seed stage business ideas. We'll do this by minimizing the time, speed, and capital involved in validating truly repeatable and scalable business models before any significant venture investment. We've an audacious goal to start 100 compelling companies over the next five years, and who knows how many beyond that. So if you're interested in radically changing the way work is done, how products are created, companies built and funded, even democratizing the wealth creation and how returns are distributed, this could be the business for you. We're looking for talent, capital, and influence. If you wish to contribute any or all of these, just get in touch. You can follow us on nobodystudios.com, on our LinkedIn page, all the social media accounts, or simply my newsletters and what I'm sharing. We'll be launching a truly innovative crowdfunding campaign, and I'd be honored if you'd be willing to join us on this journey and become a nobody yourself. <laughs>